Travis Gross, the Executive Director here at the Sheboygan County Historical Society, and uh, thank you for coming out for our final installment of our March Speaker Series on the history of transportation in Sheboygan County. Um, yes, I'm, I'm not our program coordinator, Chloe. Uh, she's much taller than I am. Uh, <laughs> uh, but she and, and baby Samuel and, and husband Josh are doing well, and rumor has it she's going to pay us a visit tomorrow. Um, so maybe we'll get to meet the, the newest member of the museum family tomorrow. Uh, so this evening, we are going to learn a little bit about uh, uh, the history of flight in Sheboygan County. So uh, we'll hear about uh, our municipal airport as well as the Aviation Heritage Museum uh, or center, excuse me, uh, that's uh, housed out at the airport. Uh, tonight joining us, we have Dave Rudd here. He's the Director of Operations, as well as Vice President of the Aviation Heritage Center. And joining him is his partner, Dan Miller, who is their resident historian. He'll have all the history, and Dave will share uh, some of the other technical aspects of the airport and, and uh, flight here in Sheboygan County. So let's welcome Dave and Dan. Hello? Okay. All right. As we were introduced, I'm Dan. This is Dave. Dave and I have been involved with the Aviation Heritage Center for quite a few years. Um, I was on the board of directors and president of the board of directors for a while, and Dave is now on the board of directors, and like, like it was told, he's uh, director of operations out there. So what I want to do is I I'm going to to do the first part of the presentation where I'm going to talk about the history of aviation in this area, how it all started, and Dave will take over later and talk about the Aviation Heritage Center and the, and the Sheboygan Memorial Airport. We both got into aviation when we were boys. We loved airplanes. Um, went to air shows, went to airports to look at airplanes, built models. The same routine that a lot of guys go through. Uh, aviation interest in this area started with um, soon after the Wright brothers flew. Several years after the Wright brothers flew, there was a lot of aviation interest in the country. I kind of equivalent to the Mercury astronauts when the space program started when I was a boy. Um, that was a big deal. It was all over the papers, all over the news. And that's kind of, went, that's kind of the way it went in early aviation. Uh, the Wright brothers flight was all over the news. It went across the United States. There was publicity, there was flights. There were more demonstrations going on and other companies were building aircraft. And it was just, it kind of like exploded in the early 1900s. And in a lot of areas across the United States, pilots would go out and barnstorm and they would demonstrate aircraft. There, were no, there weren't that many airports, so they would land at fields, fairgrounds, demonstrate the airplane's capabilities and take up some of the braver people for rides. <laughs> One of these, and in the Sheboygan area, one of the more famous aviators was Lincoln Beachy. He flew a Curtis pusher that had a prop behind the, the engine that pushed the aircraft. And he did a lot of flight demonstrations in Wisconsin. He was over in Sheboygan area doing his demonstrations. And one of the people that were watching him was Anton Bratz. Now Anton Bratz was in, in uh, he was a research engineer for Kohler Company. And he was, a, he was a very incredible person as far as I, as far as I can see. Um, he was, he not only was an ideal person, but he was an engineer person. And he was a builder. As you can see, he was just as, he was at home with a microscope as he was with a wrench. He says, there was no stop gaps here. Now you have engineers that design, or they come up with an idea, they send it to the next guy, he designs it, and they send it to the next guy, and they build it. He did it all. He had an interest in mechanics and machinery and car. He built his own car. In the early days, he built this thing and drove around and took his family on rides. It's a broad special, yes. <laughs> what a guy. Well, when he got into aviation, like anything else he did, he, did it, he didn't do it halfway. He went in on it totally. He became enthralled with it. And after that exhibition flight, 
he decided he wanted to get more involved, so he experimented with gliders. He got his own pilot's license. But getting in the air wasn't enough for him. He wanted, he wanted to get more involved. So on the south side of Sheboygan, where Union Avenue is, to the southwest, he, he uh, developed some land there, and he built his own airport. He put up a hangar, a 48 by 48 hangar. He bought two aircraft. One was a Jenny, a J4 Jenny, and the other was this standard right here, that type of aircraft. And here's the air, here's the uh, the airport. And that's either the standard or the Jenny. They look quite a bit alike sitting in front of it. He used these two aircraft to train pilots to take people for rides and exhibitions. He wasn't a born he wasn't a barnstormer type of pilot. He was a because he had an engineering background, he was very no-nonsense, practical-minded. He saw the future of aviation. He saw that there was a lot more to, to come here yet. So he was one of these kind of guys that just push the safety factor. None of his airplanes were ever lost in the air, but they were lost in other ways. <laughs> it was 1925. He had started this venture in the, in the early 20s. In 1925, a, a lightning bolt hit the hangar and burned it down, and both airplanes were inside. So he lost, he lost both aircraft. That's later. So what he did was he built a fireproof hangar and he bought this Woodson Express. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, if you can see that very well right here. There's another picture of it here. It was a more powerful biplane that would fill more of the demands that he had for aviation. And he built this supposedly indestructible hangar. Well, then a windstorm came. <laughs> lifted the roof up and crashed it down on a Woodson. So he goes, okay, but he, this guy never gave up. He was a, he was a very energetic go-getter. There, no, uh, there was no giving up for this guy. So he started rebuilding, rebuilding the Woodson. And while he was doing that, of course, he worked for Kohler. And Walter Kohler made him an offer. He said, why don't you come out by Kohler? I got an idea. I want to build an airport out there. And I want you to design it, and I want you to build it, and I want you to manage it. He said, sounds like a good deal. So he went that route. So him and Walter Kohler, they got together. They started, they started uh, operations at the Kohler Airport. And what's really unique is Walter, Walter Kohler was also a visionary like Anton Bratz. He saw the possibility of air aviation in business, in transport, and in every, any, every way possible, even private aviation. He saw, he saw the future of it and how it could really develop and help him and help other businesses. And together with Bratz, they really made a, they made a um, beautiful facility, a very productive facility at the Kohler Airport with light beacons, or with a standard tower beacon, lighted runways, asphalt or cinder for the runways, and really developed it. And it got really busy there because a lot of aviators would gravitate towards a field with these kind of facilities. They also had repair facilities. So it was, you know, hey, this is the place to go. This is the place to develop aviation. But Bratz's old airfield on the south side of Sheboygan was still operational. It was left open. People still use it. And I think this, this summer, A.J. Summer managed that airport at that time, later on when Bratz was not there. As Kohler, as Kohler developed the airport, he developed events because he he wanted, he wanted aviation to really generate in this area and keep going and keep motivating people to get into aviation. So one of the events he had was in 1930, uh, he had a, the American Legion Convention 
at Kohler and he built an aviation event around it. They had an air race from Superior, Wisconsin, because there was an airfield up there, to Kohler for that event. A group of Army aviators came in from Selfridge Field, Michigan. There was nine aviators and they came in these P-12 fighter planes. And also an Army Ford, Ford tri-motor tri -motor came in. All kinds of dignitaries, other airplanes, other pilots. It was a big show. It's, uh, it was a really great show for aviation. One of the fighter pilots was um, Austin Straubel. Is that name familiar? <laughs> His name is on the Green Bay Airport. <laughs> Another pilot was named Felix Wakis. Felix Wakis was a, um, a son of Lithuanian immigrants. Yes. Are you Lithuanian? Yes. <laughs> we have a Lithuanian in the crowd. You're going to like this if you don't already know about it. Um, uh, <clears throat> where was I? Okay. Yeah. Felix. <laughs> Yes, he was. A very good pilot, I might add, and that will come out later. But a friendship developed between Bratz, Kohler, Wakis, and Bratz's daughter, Martha. So when Felix got out of the Army Air Corps, and a year or two later, he came back to Kohler. And he was very welcome there because he was not only a good pilot, but he had an engineering background. So he fit right in with the rest of the crew at the Kohler Airport. And then it was Martha. <laughs> so a romance ensued in a marriage. And one big happy family. And they, they all got the Kohler Airport going and kept it going, kept a lot of energy in there. Other pilots were coming in. And at the same time, actually before that, Walter Kohler had bought an aircraft, a Ryan Brougham, because he knew that he needed an aircraft for his business. And the Ryan Brougham was a very sophisticated uh, piece of engineering at the time. It was also the sister ship to the Spirit of St. Louis. You can see this. If you've seen the Spirit of St. Louis, you can see the similarities. <clears throat> so Kohler became a licensed pilot, but he had other pilots fly him around because when he went on business or when he ran, ran for governor, he'd be in a back seat doing all his, his writing, his business. And uh, Werner Bunny, standing there next to Walter Kohler, was his first chief pilot. As the year progressed, um, a Lithuanian contingency out of Chicago, there was a large population of Lithuanians in the Chicago area, they came up with a national idea for their, for their Lithuanian population to get a pilot to fly across the Atlantic Ocean to Lithuania. Now, it had been, air, aircraft have crossed the ocean before this, but not many. After, after Lindbergh, there was like four other aircraft that crossed the ocean. And um, they approached Wakis because they knew he was Lithuanian said, hey, this is what we'd like to do. Are you on board with it? And he said, sure. They had already purchased an aircraft, a Lockheed Vega, which at that time was one of the most sophisticated aircraft in the country. It was big, it was powerful, and it had range. Unfortunately, the year before that, the Lithuanians had tried to attempt another crossing with a different aircraft and they had a fatal crash in Germany. But that wasn't gonna that wasn't gonna give they weren't gonna give up on it. So they got money together and they bought this Vega from the Shell Oil Company that had been flown by Jimmy Doolittle at one time. So they brought it to the Kohler Airport. Wakis and Bratz did the modifications on the aircraft. What they did was they took the old engine off and they put a bigger, more powerful 550 horsepower Pratt & Whitney on there 
for the <clears throat> for the power that they needed to take off, and then they stuffed the cabin full of fuel tanks, 670 gallons of fuel. Yeah, and that <laughs> it's a lot of gas for that airplane. It's a flying gas tank. And then they also to put new instrumentation in it and a new directional radial. So the plane was decked out. But when you got it all done and everything's loaded, it's 8,000 pounds. So they did the testing at Kohler Airport. And then they flew out, then Wakeus flew out to um, Roosevelt Field in New York. I got a little picture of Roosevelt Field here, but it's... It's a little bit more modern than it was. You can look at it later if you'd like. But he flew out to Roosevelt Field and then they did fuel testing. They put so much fuel in the airplane, take off, come back. When the fuel got to a certain degree that was so heavy that it would stress the landing gear, they dumped the fuel in the air and came back and loaded up with more fuel and they kept that up. I don't know how many days or weeks they did that with. They finally, to see if the airplane could take the weight off the runway. So they finally got to that stage where they could, they knew they could get off. So it filled up the fill up the tanks, and on September 25th, I do believe, September 22nd, 21st, 1935, he took off from Roosevelt Field on his way to Lithuania. The idea was to fly at a certain altitude, so he could use tailwinds but there was too much icing up there. So he had to bring the aircraft down below the clouds, but then there was a headwind. <laughs> and um, he consumed way too much fuel. By the time he got to Ireland, he knew he didn't have enough fuel to get to Lithuania. And because of his radio, he was able to tell that there was fog over England and fog over Germany. Doesn't look good. So he's gonna land in Ireland get gas and continue on the, on the flight. When he was flying over Ireland, he was looking for a place to land and chasing cattle away so he could find a place, <laughs> place to come down because there was no airfield. So, and then he was dodging haystacks and a wall, <laughs> stone wall. And uh, the aircraft caught a wing like so came around and busted the landing gear, broke it up. So there he was. Well, the venture's over, not getting the Lithuania flying. But what they did was they crated it up and they shipped it to Lithuania. <laughs> There's humor there, huh? Not for him, but anyway, his wife, Martha, she sailed across the Safeway and met him in Lithuania. And then they had the royal treatment there, of course. And um, then he, um, they both went, after they got all the celebration over, they came back to Kohler. And, uh, excuse me, I gotta get a little water. <laughs> and uh, Wakeus would continue to work into my pictures. Wickes would continue to work with Bratz and Kohler at the airport. But uh, he also went on to study aeronautical engineering at UW-Madison, the same place that Lindbergh went, but Lindbergh didn't do so well there. But he <laughs> went to UW-Madison, and he also went to MIT. The guy was smart. The guy knew his aviation. And he went on to work for Boeing Aircraft Company and became a test pilot for the, for the uh, B-17s and the B-29s during the war. Unfortunately, he, his life was not long. He, sh he died at 49, he had a short life. But uh, his contribution to aviation is astounding. And in this area, we call him our Lindbergh. He was the sixth person to solo across the Atlantic Ocean. The sixth. And he came from here. Yeah, I know. Um, when, I was, when I was a boy, I read all about aviators and uh, famous aircraft and famous aviators 
aces and all works. I never gave this area much thought. I thought it was always going to be an exotic location like California, New York, someplace else. That's where all the big names were. That's where all the um, famous people were. Little did I know until I got to the Aviation Center that we had a guy like this in our history. Guys like Kohler, Bratz, Wakus. I mean, the, and, the, and the names are endless. <clears throat> Some other ones, and during this time period, um, as the Kohler Airport get more and more developed, the air traffic increased. And for a town of 1,800, there was no other town in in the whole state of Wisconsin that had the air traffic that we had here. It was amazing. Air traffic, air shows, aviation activities, Kohler's Ryan Brome. Bratz in the Woods and Express was here, Mel Thompson's Wacko 10, Joe Richardson's Travel Air, and many others, including a female aviator who stopped by. Her name was Nellie Weilhout, Will Height. She was the first licensed woman aviator from South Dakota. And um, she married a guy from Sheboygan. And um, she was commissioned by the governor of South Dakota to fly a letter to Governor Kohler here. <laughs> but she didn't land. She dropped it with a parachute, with a piece of granite from Mount, from Mount Rushmore. That's how it was publicity. That's how it was delivered. <laughs> yes. Uh, And in, in August of 1931, Bratz was always experimenting with his airplanes, trying to set records. In 1931, he took the, the Woodson Express up to 17,000 feet without oxygen as an experiment. <laughs> yes. Um, Anton Bratz Jr., Bratz's son, was also, also studied engineering, and he went on to work at North American Aviation and helped design the P-51 Mustang and the B-25 Bomber. These people all came from Sheboygan area, which is amazing, designing these aircraft. You know, I just, I'm just enthralled by this. As Kohler and Bratz got older, they became less involved in aviation, and <clears throat> aviation events kind of slowed down at the airport. But Mel Bratz, who was Kohler's, one of Kohler's chief pilots also, not Mel, not Mel Bratz, Mel Thompson, yeah. Mel Thompson, who is a, kind of like a, uh, a legend in this area when it comes to aviation. So many aviators, older aviators will tell you, Mel Thompson taught me how to fly. Mel Thompson did this, Mel Thompson did that. Mel Thompson barnstormed. He had a training school for pilots. He fixed aircraft he had at the Kohler Airport, and he managed the Kohler Airport until 1961, when the new Memorial Airport was built. So he touched aviation in so many ways. All these guys, all these people, the Richardson brothers, um, the list is just endless how many guys were involved in aviation at the Kohler Airport. And they touched so many other people. They, they trained other pilots. They, they fostered aviation. Kohler knew that if he did this, aviation industry would grow. The Ryan Brome was the Learjet of its day. So was the Lockheed Vega. These aircraft were instrumental in developing aviation on all levels. And Kohler Airport was right in the center of it. How about that? A little extra here. Um, the, Kohler, the beacons that Kohler had at the airport, Kohler was building generators. And these beacons were going to be needed, 
would be needed at remote locations where there was no electricity hookup. So the Kohler generators were used for these beacons. So all over the world, 11,000 miles of airway, 600 Kohler units. They were used for, the beacons were used for uh, Pan American Clipper airplane flights in the Pacific. Um, they were used by all over the South American area. Just hundreds and hundreds of airfields that were remote, remotely located were powered by ch Kohler generators with their beacons. So that's another contribution that Kohler made to aviation. He was also a champion of aviation. And some of the laws he pushed or some of the ideas he pushed towards aviation were, were fundamental and used in aviation for years. That was just a little extra on there. But that's the contribution that these gentlemen and these companies made in this area. And that kind of concludes my part. Dave? Here we go. Here we go. Um, well, I'd like to thank Dan for uh, giving his presentation. When we were bouncing stuff off, uh, doing this presentation, we were kind of bouncing stuff off of each other, and I was amazed the stuff that I learned from him. So uh, <laughs> it's it kind of nice. I'm gonna, I'm going to do a, a presentation on the uh, uh, Sheboygan County Airport and how that all got started all the way up to present day. Um, I'm going to have some fun stuff in there, some stuff that uh, you might know and you might not know, and I'm going to kind of ask you, uh, especially about the dedication, if anybody's been there, but uh, I was at uh, uh, both, of, both of the Ryder Cup and the 2015 uh, golf outings, and so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, so in 1955, uh, the Sheboygan Common Council, they decided to, uh, they had all these airports over, over the city. They had uh, the Vandervaart, they had uh, the Bratz, they had the Kohler, they had uh, Polarware had an airport. They, these are all grass strips and stuff. So they, what they did was, uh, they, the jet age was just starting to, to come in in the 1950s, and these were all grass strips, and they, they had the vision and the, the foresight to say, hey, we have to get some more people into the, uh, um, uh, as far as uh, jets coming in and stuff like that. So they had to build an airport. Um, they uh, w went to uh, um, the Sheboygan County and they said, uh, we'd like to, to uh, build an airport. So what they did was they had the Wisconsin Aer Aeronautical uh, commission. They said you got two spots. Uh, one was uh, uh, section 13, and that was two miles north of Sheboygan Falls. The other one was uh, section 15, where the airport is right now, and that's uh, about a uh, mile and a half or two miles uh, northwest of the airport. So uh, Oscar Damro, he got a group of uh, uh, guys together. It was uh, uh, Edwin Fessler, was a chair of that committee, and also uh, uh, Walter uh, Walter Walter Ireland. So they got together in, in with the uh, the rest of the committee, and uh, they started in 1955, uh, going around and getting uh, all all the stuff together, the financing, the the. Plots uh, where where they're gonna where they're gonna build it. Well, anyways, the uh, Wisconsin Aeronautical uh, Commission said that uh, they wanted Section 13 was not what uh, quite right for for the airport, so they did Section uh, 15, and so they started to uh, plan around that, and then they went to uh, uh, the landowners. Bought land from the Strauss family, the the Kriplings, the Markwerts, the uh, uh, the Schlichtings, and they bought the property. They started 
uh, getting that all, all bought up. Then they went to uh, um, different uh, uh, construction uh, people. They went to Reliance for the black topping, and they went to a cramp for the uh, um, for the digging and the, the excavating of the, the airport. So when uh, they, that was uh, back in 1959, uh, Walter Ireland broke the uh, dug the first shovel of dirt for the Sheboygan County Airport. Um, so things started to move pretty quickly. By 1960, they they needed an airport manager. So uh, actually, this this is what the airport looked like when they got done with it. The airport was. Uh, built in two, two phases. One was the, the runways, and the other one was the buildings, the navigation, the lights, and all, uh, all that stuff. So they got that put together, and when they, uh, they, uh, uh, they had to go out and, and find an a airport manager. So the, they went around, and they knew that uh, Chaplin had a Air Park out in Plymouth. Harry Chaplin, a uh, little story on him, Harry, Harry Chaplin was in the, the Air Force at the time, or Army Air Corps, and he came back. His mother uh, had the family farm, Edith, and they turned the family farm into an air park out in Plymouth. She, uh, uh, Harry's dad, Harvey, was with, uh, uh, he had his lighting uh, business so what he did was he, he uh, uh, put some money towards it, and he, he built uh, the first hangar on Chaplin Air Park. So Harry was running that, uh, that air park, and he got called by, by the uh, commission or committee, and by that time he was running a, a bunch of uh, different airports. Uh, he had five airports that he, he was running. Uh, or five airports that he ran. One was uh, the Wapaka Municipal, the Sheboygan, of course, the Sheboygan County, Chaplin Air Park, uh, and also Manitowoc and Baraboo. So he knew pretty much about uh, how to run a uh, uh, airport. So then he uh, he got on board, and, and like I said, everything's starting to work pretty quick here. Um, they, like I said, they broke ground in 1959. They got the fun funds and stuff for it, uh, and they got the runways built. By 1960, they were uh, flying airplanes on that, that field. It wasn't quite done, but uh, that's that's Harry Chaplin right there. So he, he, uh, he got a bunch of it going along with the committees, and also uh, uh, they got they, in 1962, they got the airport done. Um, they had a bunch of, uh, they had a big dedication, and that's where I, I'd like you to come in. How many people were at that dedication? Does it, has anybody been to the dedication? I, I've had, uh, I've talked to a couple people. That was a, a, a work in progress in itself because they had uh, different uh, uh, things going on there. The first, the first day it rained, so they, they had to cancel everything, except for uh, Cole P Palin, who, uh, he came in from the Rhinebeck Museum out in New York. He flew in his spad. Uh, unfortunately, the grass was wet, because he, he couldn't land on the, the paved runways. He landed on the grass, because I was a tail dragger. He, uh, uh, crashed in one of the ravines and broke broke one of the wings. So um, after talking to, to Ryle, uh, Harry's Harry's son, Harry was, or, or Ryle was 15 at the time, but he worked on a lot of, lot of airplanes as far as uh, doing fabric and stuff like that. So uh, uh, they brought it into a hangar and Ryle says, well, I can, I can do the fabric and stuff on that airplane. And I'm sure Colin was saying, I'm not going to listen to a 15-year-old kid, you know, but sure enough, they spent all night, uh, 4 o'clock, they finally got done with the airplane, and he got the flight the next day. So I, I thought that was pretty amazing. Um, there was estimated between uh, 15 and 20,000 people. As you can see up on the top, top here, there's a lot of people here. Uh, there was uh, 
uh, military jets. There was a parachute team. There was also uh, a lot of regular regular airplanes coming in to, to the dedication. Uh, the, the Saturday of the dedication, it, it, it was a ribbon cutting. And uh, so they, they did the ribbon cutting and stuff like that. They had to cancel the air show, except for uh, a coal, coal there. And the next day, was the, it was a lot sunnier. And they pulled the, uh, uh, happened to pull the air, uh, air show and the uh, dedication off. The, the second thing is um, the, they had a, a dedication or a memorial on uh, Sunday. And if you ever wonder how uh, the Sheboygan got its name or the Sheboygan County Memorial Airport, it was uh, dedicated to all the, the war women and men that uh, died in the wars uh, previously. So that's, that's why you got the uh, Sheboygan County uh, Memorial Airport. I know I was at a meeting one time, we were all talking and, and wondering how come they called it Memorial Airport. So um, they, they were given airplane rides. Uh, they used to give airplane rides for a penny a pound. So uh, <laughs> if you're 70 pounds, it's 70 cents, you know. So that was kind of interesting. Um, there was the, the uh, Red Cross or the first aid people there. Luckily, there was no incidents except for for the SPAD there, and uh, there, there was a couple, actually there was there was two. Uh, one of the parachutes burned his hand on a flare, and there was a little girl there that got her thumb bit by a, a field mouse. So, <laughs> so I, th I thought that was kind of cute. Um, so that, the day went off pretty well. Everything ended at five o'clock, uh, and they had, uh, uh, different displays. They had miss, missiles, uh, military jets. Uh, th another funny thing about it is, they had uh, uh, the, at the dedication they had generals and, and commanders and stuff uh, do the the dedication, and from Truax Field. Uh, so they had a, a, a F one hundred and two jet uh, come up from uh, uh, Truax Field, and. They had the uh, a car in, in the middle of Sheboygan County, and they raced to see who would get to the airport fastest. Now, I've been trying to ask uh, a bunch of people who won that race, and I could never find nobody to tell me who, who won the race, but uh, the jet made it up in 12 minutes. So, so uh, uh, that... That's a C-119. Uh, there, there was also a, a C-123 uh, up there. Um, also, uh, uh, there was uh, P-51 Mustangs that did a, a formation and stuff like that. There was a, um, what else happened there? There was a, uh, they had some jets coming up from Truax. They couldn't land, but they did fly over. Uh, here's, here's a program from the, the dedication. So it's wings over Sheboygan County. And of course, you can see that uh, uh, it was a memorial to all the flyers killed in, in, in action. And that was July 28th and 29th of 1962. They had some commuter airplanes. While back in the 1960s, also, uh, Harry and, and the committee were trying to get some, uh, some commuter airlines in here. Uh, the first one they, they went to was uh, uh, North Central. And North Central had already been going into the Manitowoc Airport. So they were, they were in a, uh, labor or negotiations as far as uh, uh, getting there, and they, they thought that the airports were too close to where they, either Sheboygan could drive up to Manitowoc or Manitowoc could come down to Sheboygan. But they ended up uh, uh, choosing Manitowoc. Um, they, although the uh, North Central still did go into Sheboygan, very few times, either to pick up uh, uh, freight or, or some passengers. But there's a bunch of different uh, uh, airlines. Uh, the first one at Sheboygan was the commuter airlines. And, and the, there's uh, Mid-State and also Air Wisconsin. Air, Air Wisconsin was uh, uh, flying twin, twin otters at the time, and they'd come in, they'd load people, and they'd take off. Uh, some of the routes were uh, all the way down to Indiana, Chicago, Detroit, 
uh, Minneapolis, Stevens Point, and where else did they go? Where I've deep, yeah, they went to Detroit, uh, Kokomo, Indiana, stuff like that. Um, so that's, and this this is what the airport uh, looks now like now. I should I shouldn't say it looks like that now. Back uh, there was three three different changes as far as the airport uh, as far as the runways because the jets and stuff would get bigger. So uh, uh, they had to extend the runways. And uh, the, the first runways that they built were uh, uh, 3,600 to and a 3,000 foot runway. The, the second uh, expansion was uh, as far as uh, uh, it was uh, 5,000 foot, the, the north, northwest and southeast were 5,000 foot and the other one was 40, uh, 5,400 feet, the long, the long runway right here. Let me see here. Yeah, right here. Yeah, it's 2-1 and 0-3 at the time. Then back in the, in the 2000, 2006, they, they did another expansion on it. As the jets got bigger, uh, the, the golfers were coming in, the, the passengers were coming in, and it's to present day. It's uh, the runways are uh, 6,800 by or 6,800 feet by 100 wide, and the uh, the northwest and south southeast is uh, uh, it's 5,200 by 75 feet. So that uh, um, and as you can see here, they they start to add mo more buildings. The corporates are down here. Uh, on this this one, the Heritage Center isn't even built. So it was before 2004. Um, now, now we get up to uh, uh, when uh, um, they they wanted to do another expansion, and part of, part of it was the they wanted U.S. Customs here because Kohler was traveling overseas. That uh, both of their planes, the Gulfstream and the Global. Um, both can uh, travel overseas, and what they wanted was the uh, uh, to uh, use customs instead of landing in either New York or I know Plenko landed in Mexico or uh, I'm sorry Texas, and then uh, so or or flying to Green Bay so or Racine so they uh, they decide that it'd be a lot easier that way they wouldn't have to land and then shut down the jet go through customs and then take off again. It's just a little bit easier, especially with the, the range on those jets that they could fly right to Sheboygan. And so they decided to uh, build a, a, a customs and the terminal and the, uh, it ho also houses uh, the uh, airport manager. And uh, so they they built this. I, I believe this was about uh, f uh, $4.5 million dollar, uh, uh, addition this is this is what the terminal looks like it's a uh, it's a nice nice people can come in relax the pilots can come in grab coffee watch TV stuff like that and the passengers can go through to pick up their transportation so it's it's so far it's working out working out really nice um, the, the the customs is is here, and then there's also a door here, where you go through, or you go out, go in through the uh, uh, outside to, to customs. They have a, a, a locking cell. They have uh, bathrooms, stuff like that in there. Um, they have an incinerator because all the stuff that comes off the airplane, if it was, uh, uh, you know, like uh, any type of perishables or fruit or anything, that that's all got to be incinerated. Here's here's kind of the customs window. Um, some people can pass some stuff through there, but they usually have a door. Um, here's what the airport looks like now. As you can see, uh, we have a, uh, another building down at the end. This is our. Has anybody been to the restaurant or or out to the airport uh, to go through? They they call it a FBO. It's a fixed base operation. That's I always say to people, it's kind of where they get their gas or their, their rides, 
their taxis, stuff like that, their rental cars. So right now, that's that's right up on the top. It's called Burroughs Aviation. Uh, these here are all the corporates. We got the Kohler hangar, um, the Bratz hangar, as as at the um, uh, Richardson, Richardson, uh, Bemis, uh, Kohler. Kohler's got Terry Kohler, or Windway Corporation, has two, two hangers here. Um, one's maintenance and one's for storage of their airplane. Um, let me see what else we got here. What, um, what's that? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. We, we, have, the her <laughs> we have the heritage, I can't forget that. Um, yeah, the, the, the other, uh, uh, right here, was the, the first FBO that they built back in 1961. Uh, they, built, they built that. They had uh, a, oh. Let's see if you can't move it. Here we go. Uh, and then uh, they, they had a row of hangers that got redone. As you can see, it's, it's all nice black top and paved. The, they did the, the ramp one year, and that went from black top to about 12 inches of concrete, because as these jets get bigger, they also get heavier. So uh, this picture here is, is from the uh, uh, NASCAR race last year. So you can see all the, the uh, uh, regional jets or the race team jets. Some of them had three. I know Dale Earnhardt had, Jr. had three of them there. And uh, uh, Joe Gibbs and uh, some of the other teams had, had a bunch of jets there. Because and this this is a regional jet. This is this is one of Dale Earnhardt's uh, uh, jets. Uh, it holds 50 passengers. So and it and that's how they get back and forth to the, the race tracks. Th this year, uh, another fun event that we had besides NASCAR was the uh, uh, Ryder Cup. Like I said, I, I was at the 2015. I helped out with that. Uh, ma mainly my job was just unloading and loading up uh, uh, bags. So you're, you're he those airplanes are tall, and you're just heaving bags up into the baggage compartment. Um, got got to see Tiger Woods and, and uh, Phil Mickelson and, and celebrities like that. So... Um, Right here, uh, I'll show a picture of our DC-3, but that's the DC-3 is right here. We, uh, and that's one of our projects that we're working on. But uh, as you can see, during the Ryder Cup, they had all, we closed this runway down right here, and those were all jets. Uh, it was amazing that the that work that went into it, uh, the crew that we worked with. I, I also, our, our chapter, EA chapter, helped out with that event, and we also, uh, uh, had jet jet events. It's a company that's from Minneapolis. They came down. They'd bring the jet in. They'd park it. Our our job was to to get the passengers up to the terminal um, so that they could get their their either their fuel or their their ride out to the the golf course. Um, get that all straightened out. By the time the girls at the desk had that all straightened out, we had their baggage off the plane and up to the front door loading into their taxi or, or uh, van or whatever they were taking out to the the uh, um, the golf course or to their hotels um, it, was, it was kind of kind of amazing too because with, with the Ryder Cup the I should say I should back up the the PGA in 2015 was more of a serious thing where the Ryder Cup was uh, I I can't tell you how much beer and wine I unloaded off those airplanes. <laughs> and on the way back, I loaded more spotted cow into those airplanes than you would not believe. Um, and I kept on saying some of those to some of the passengers. It's like, uh, we have beer in Wisconsin here. It's, you know, we're probably the beer capital of the world. But uh, no, they brought their own. Um, it was a lot of fun. The people were a lot of fun. And so, uh, yeah, it was a, a very well organized. The county did a great job, uh, jet events, and uh, we our, our EAA chapter just had a little part in that. 
Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, people were flying in. This is also the Ryder Cup. People were flying in in their, in their private jets. This, this jet right here is a, uh, what they call a quarter share. So if you, if you don't have a plane, you can rent them. And I, I'm not quite sure how much how much it is, uh, maybe three four thousand bucks, depending upon where you're going. But uh, a lot of people came in um, on on the jets like that, the pri private jets. Um, we had for uh, the Ryder Cup, we had uh, 11, 1,100 to twelve hundred operations. The uh, uh, five hundred aircraft on the field and six international flights. Uh, I know one, one came in from Ireland, but he, he landed in, uh, um, in New York. Um, we've had, we had uh, uh, because Rolex was putting on the event, they came in from Switzerland, they went through customs. We also had some people from uh, Canada and, and uh, Mexico that came in, had to go through customs. So there, so there was uh, some people that did use the, the customs facility. Um, see what else? Oh, uh, every every time I took a uh, either a pilot or a passenger out to the runway, we had to stop and take a picture of that airplane. Do you, do you know whose airplane that is? That's Michael Jordan's. Michael Jordan came to the, the golf course, and uh, I. Every time I drove past that thing, I'm still trying to figure out what what the design on the airplane is. Uh, yeah, and I don't know if you can see, but you can see the jumping man in the back here, and the, usually the MJ, the two, 236 MJ, that's Michael Jordan. Um, so he, he came. I didn't didn't see him at all, um, although I did see a couple of basketball players, uh, Steph Curry. I, I picked him up. He came in a private jet like the one you saw before. Didn't know who he was. I'm not really a basketball player or a, a basketball person, so um, so that was uh, kind of kind of funny because uh, when he left, everybody, oh, did you see Steph Curry? And I go, who is he? You know, don't don't know. <laughs> um, so now now I'd like to get back into the the Aviation Heritage Center. Uh, the Aviation Heritage Center was built in 2004, or I should say, uh, the Dick. Yeah, it was, the first shovel was 2004, de uh, dedicated it in 2006. Um, we, we had a, I, I can, I'll just go over a little brief story about the Heritage Center. Uh, the chapter was meeting at different different spots all over, the Bemis Hangar, a uh, couple of bars, s &R Bar, um, uh, the, just different places, and we had stuff all over. And finally, yes? The EA chapter in Sheboygan. It's very yes. Yep. The uh, uh, chapter 766, 766. It's our own little Sheboygan, Sheboygan County chapter. We yeah, th we we had no home, <laughs> so we thought we went to different donors and said, "Hey, we we'd like to build a, a clubhouse," and the donor says, "You're you're not building a clubhouse. We're not going to donate to a clubhouse. But we if you if you invite the public or build it for the public." We'll donate so 1.5 million dollars. That's what we had. Um, the airplane, uh, the gate guard on in the front. That's a T30 T33, and we uh, we picked that up off of uh, eBay. It, was, <laughs> it it didn't look that that nice. Uh, uh, we we uh, had a semi truck uh, bring it up, and uh, it didn't look that nice when we we were working on it. But they polished it all up, and we put it on a pole and. And had a uh, beautiful dedication. Uh, the dedication we had, uh, of course, Terry Kohler was there, and also Paul Poberesny. I don't know if you know about the EA. Paul Poberesny is president. We had him come down and speak, which uh, Paul Paul's a great great guy. Uh, I when I first called to to have him come down, uh, it's I'm sorry, it's a little side story here, but. Uh, I was driving, or I'm sorry, I was uh, calling up to, to, to his secretary. He said, hey, we'd like to have Paul come down and, and uh, uh, dedicate our T-33. She goes, well, wait, hang on a minute. I'll, I'll talk to Paul, and uh, we'll see what we can do. So I, I figured that she's going to call me back. One, one morning, I was driving to the airport, and all of a sudden, I get this call. He says, 
Dave? I go, yes. This is Paul Poberesny. I'm, I'm coming down to your dedication. And I thought that was the coolest thing because I thought he'd have a secretary or, or one of his staff call, but he personally called himself. So um, he, he came down with his wife, and, and it, was a, it was a nice time. Uh, we, we do other projects, too. We, we have the T-28. Uh, that project was um, dedicated to uh, the Hmong who fought in Laos. Uh, there's a lot of Hmong population in Sheboygan, uh, many, Minneapolis, and also uh, the California area. And so we, we put that together, and we had a de dedication on that. We had the pilots come out. We had uh, uh, the T-28s that usually meet at Sheboygan. We had them flying over. We also uh, uh, had the, the Hmong pilots meet the, the instructors that they had back in Laos. So it was kind of a, 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 a tear-jerking time too, because they were telling stories. But that that was a great uh, that was a great project. And so this this airplane, as you in the next slide, you'll see uh, we uh, picked that one up in Rockford, Illinois. A guy was going to rebuild it and just never uh, got got to doing it. So we we bought that. I can talk a little bit about our museum and our our. Uh, our next project, which is uh, uh, the DC-3. When we, when we decided to do this DC-3, we wanted a, a Wisconsin-based airline. And so we, we decided on North Central Airlines. The, uh, um, it, it was amazing to me that when we decided to put the word out to the North Central retirees that all the stuff that came from them, their basements, I mean, uh, it's it's am just amazing the the tools and the uh, like. There's a ski bag here. I couldn't believe that they'd keep all that stuff. But uh, here's a full case of uh, uh, ashtrays and matches and you name it. They they brought it. It was nice. Um, he here's our, our one of our uh, memorabilia from from Sheboygan County people. They. Uh, um, they drop stuff off, and, and we put it into the uh, into the display cases for uh, viewing and stuff. Um, we have the Hertzinger, a uh, couple pictures from Hertzinger's sausage. I don't know if anybody remembers them. Um, uh, we we have a, a bunch of different different uh, people that uh, we collected stuff from. Uh, Paul Hammer, uh, he's an attorney in Sheboygan. He dropped off his models which are really nice. Um, they're super uh, museum quality. Um, here's, here's our Hmong exhibit. Uh, not only do we have the plane, but we also have the, the exhibit. Um, and when the Hmong come in, uh, I always like talking to them because they can pick out any place on that airport where they were and where the general lived, the movie theater, the schools, the, um, you name it. They, uh, there was also a, a, the monk, uh, religious, they were up there. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, if you ever get out to the Heritage Center, please stop and see, see that exhibit. Um, the, as Dan was talking, the Felix Huecas Museum, or uh, exhibit, uh, we have a, a full exhibit on that. And it, it gives you the, the map, when he crossed, and some of the other stuff. Like Dan said, he was uh, uh, treated as a, uh, hero for for going across the uh, uh, Atlantic. It was it was quite a feat at that time. We have some more uh, uh, North Central stuff. Uh, like I said, they, they donated uh, stewardesses and captains' uniforms. Um, it gives the routes that they they flew. Uh, stuff advertising, stuff like that. So um, airplanes, you name it. They they gave it to us. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen that many luggage uh, tags in my life. <laughs> so uh, what, what happened with the DC-3 is they, it was started by uh, FWD Corporation. And uh, they, they had a, a little bob, uh, Cessna Bobcat. They were flying people around. And they got into uh, uh, saying, hey, let's, let's uh, start an airline. So they went up to the bigger airplanes. The, the DC-3 was the, the main one after that. Uh, the 
Convairs to all the way up to the DC nines. Uh, has anybody ever flown on North Central Airlines? You have. Okay. Yeah. There's every every time that I go out to the airport, somebody says, "Yeah." As a, when I was a kid, I used to fly fly on North Central. So it was, uh, it's cool to to listen to those stories. It's also cool to listen to the pilot stories. Uh, usually, I'm out there on Sunday afternoons, and they have all kinds of stories that they tell me. Um, we have a, a upper deck observation deck. You can go out and see the airplanes. Let's see what else we got. We got a library, and during the T28 clinic, this is where they camp out for, for the weekend. Um, we have a T28, or what what we call a T28 clinic. They There's pilots from all over the country, from California to New Jersey. They come here, they do their formation flyings, and they get their uh, uh, ratings and stuff like that. So it's it's not only fun, but it's pretty serious stuff. Uh, I've, I've flown... Every once in a while, they'll let me uh, uh, jump a ride with them, so uh, it's it's quite impressive. Those airplanes are noisy, and they have a lot of power. Um, it's amazing when they're just uh, doing a turn that you see that top plane just hanging in the in that blue sky. It's quite a picture. Uh, we have a gift shop where we sell anything anywhere from hats to shirts to mugs to models to books to you name it. Um, so we, we have that, and we make a little money off of that. Uh, here's another project that we uh, started. Uh, we wanted to do something for kids. So what we did was we one of our board members had this in his garage. <laughs> and uh, he, was down in, he, was, he was down in Franklin. And, and the, the story behind that is he, he picked it up in a museum out in California, and he... He is a, a kind of gadget guy, and he was going to make that into a, a simulator with all the gauges and stuff working. And that thing sat in his garage for a while, and his wife said, you know, the kids are getting older. Uh, we need room for another car when they start driving. So the, the uh, T-33 had to go. So he went down and picked that up, and that, was, that uh, section was just a mess. Uh, that, that poor girl had a, a pretty rough life. Uh, when it was new, it, cra it crashed, and so we resurrected it, and now what we want to do is, uh, in fact, we, we have it out there right now, and we have kids jumping in it, and, and we have a yoke that they can play with, and we have guns sounding, and we have sound uh, of the engines r starting up and running, and we also have headsets to where they can hear the two pilots talking to each other, so it's, it's kind of a cool little uh, demonstrator. Uh, what we want to do is uh, take it to different, maybe, schools. Um, I know we've ar already uh, been asked by Oshkosh during Air Venture to bring it up in the Warbird area. So uh, hopefully we can make a, make a little money off of it. Um, we were talking about the T-28. That's, that's what it looked like when we got it. So we, we did a lot of work on it. Uh, we brought it up in a semi-truck from Rockford, Illinois. And I forget how long we worked on it. It wasn't that long. But we, we had a, a, a full crew uh, working on it. Uh, here's, here's our next project, the DC-3. That, uh, that came out, uh, the story on the DC-3, we were looking around, uh, as I said, for North Central, we were looking around at different places to where we can find a DC-3. And we found one in in Illinois, it was just on the other side of the border, and uh, that thing was buried into the ground. And we thought, oh, well, how are we gonna get that thing back? You know, were we gonna put it on a ship, bring it back, or were we gonna take it apart, put it on a trailer, or what? And by the time we decided, somebody had already went in there, dug it out of the mud, fired up the engines, and took off. Uh, so we lost that one. This one here, we found out in, uh, uh, no, no, we, we found that in, uh, uh, Victorville, California, uh, out in the desert. Uh, it was a perfect place for the airplane. Uh, the, well, the story on that one, the guy, uh, he had a, a helicopter service that he was doing uh, tours on the Grand Canyon. And that was his, kind of his chase plane where he put all his gear and stuff in. And unfortunately, that uh, never panned out. So that, that uh, airplane was sitting by his house. Um, 
just sitting there. Uh, he worked on it every once in a while, but uh, all of a sudden the insurance company goes, uh, you can't have that DC-3 sitting by your house with the fuel and stuff in it. So uh, he had to move it down to a, a, hit one of his buddy's hangers. So we went out there, worked on it, hasn't flown for 20 years, got the uh, engines uh, fired up after 20 years, uh, the smoke's just bellowing out of the exhaust, oil all over, but it was so cool to see that uh, thing fire up. Uh, th it was uh, 1940. It was built in 1941. Uh, it was first purchased by Eastern Airlines. We uh, um, we f we found out after looking at the serial numbers and stuff that uh, uh, that was actual uh, Eastern, or excuse me, a, a North Central Airline uh, airplane. So that that was that was pretty cool to find uh, actual North Central Airline. Uh, DC-3. So our, our, our plans with the airplane is, is the minimum is we're going to have it as a static display. The, our goal, or what we'd like to do, is get it back to running status because they flew it back from California and uh, they had a, a, a list or a page of stuff that uh, uh, was wrong with it. The only thing that uh, one of, one of the guys said is that uh, the only thing that was working on it that everything worked on was were the lights so uh, that was kind of kind of amazing after sitting at that uh, many years um, so I, I'm inviting everybody to come out take a look at it uh, go inside uh, maybe bring back some memories when used to fly I've had uh, uh, the vice president or excuse me uh, the president's daughter back at, back in the day 1950s the daughter uh, she she came out to take a look at it, and her husband. I've also had uh, the great was it the great granddaughter or the granddaughter of uh, uh, FWD Corporation came out, and they were just amazed that uh, uh, with the airplane. Well, uh, there, there's an, <laughs> there's a yeah there's a story that I I don't know if I want to tell, but I'll tell it anyhow. We we were going to take. Uh, work on the engines, take the engines off. At one time, that was a thought of ours, you know, and work on them and stuff like that. So we parked it up against the building, which was great. But we there was one problem: we forgot to lock the wheel, the tail wheel. Remember, if you remember when we had all those strong winds, and we had chocks underneath the wheels, but, and but that the wind was so strong on that tail. That's a huge tail that uh, it just pushed that thing into our building and it caught the wingtip. So now, right now, we're we're looking for a wingtip. Um, it crunched a wingtip, and we'll we'll get that fixed. E either one of two ways: we have one that we're looking at down in uh, Florida, Lakeland, Florida, or we'll just rebuild the, the wingtip. So yeah, that uh, that was a bad mistake that we learned learned, you know. Uh, but I, when uh, I got the call from the volunteer. At the Heritage Center, saying that the airplane turned turned into the building. I thought, there's no way, because that I mean that's a heavy aircraft. And uh, sure enough, I got out there and I said, oh boy, so that's not good. So uh, we do different things out at the at the Heritage Center. Uh, this is Dorothy, one of our volunteers, and and she always had the craft shows. Has any of the women been to their, one of our craft shows? No, uh, she does craft shows out there. Um, so we do craft shows, and here's some of the stuff that uh, they put out there for sale. Uh, we have weddings. We used to do weddings. Uh, uh, this wedding was, was beautiful. Uh, the bride did a great job. Um, you can't even tell it was a hanger with all the up lighting and stuff like that. She did a really nice job. Um, we have uh, sock ops. Uh, we had uh, the Eldorados come. Like Travis was saying, he, you guys had the, the Eldorados for your uh, sock hop also. So he had the uh, Eldorados out. Uh, actually, Stu, Stu is one of our volunteers at the time. He says, you guys got to raise some money out here. Let's, let's get the band out here and play. So um, we have a couple of sock hoppers, a poodle, poodle dress and leather jacket and stuff. Uh, we have hanger dances. So these, these people are, are all in... in uh, uh, 1940s uh, military outfits. That was another fun event we had. Um, we have different car clubs coming out. 
We have the uh, this summer, past summer, we had the Corvette Club come out. Corvette Club come out. Uh, there's over 40, 42 Corvettes coming out. Uh, we have the Model T Club coming out. We have the Porsche Club coming out. They check out because they're looking for places to go. So they they come out here. Uh, the Corvette Club had their meeting out there, a little dinner. So that was, that was nice. Um, we have kids uh, tours. Um, they come out to preschool all the way up to, to high school. Uh, so we have have those kids coming out. We have uh, what we call youth aviation. Um, it's a it's a day course for that kids can learn how to, to uh, different parts of the airplane. And, and at the end of the day, we give them an airplane ride, and that's that's the highlight of their day. Um, we also do merit badges. So we had the Boy Scouts. A lot of these scouts are from uh, Chicago area. They came up. Uh, here's here's another uh, uh, Boy Scout troop. We did uh, 60 Boy Scouts in, in one day, us, us three, which was, <laughs> that was a, a pretty long day. Yeah, it was a lot of flying. Um, and we have different kids come out. and uh, We have a, a program from, through EAA called the uh, Young Eagles Program. And we, uh, we give kids uh, from 8 to 17 uh, their air, airplane ride and tell them about the airplane. Uh, I, I'm very proud of, of him. Uh, I don't know, if, does anybody go to Trinity Lutheran in Sheboygan? This is, uh, uh, he, he is Josh Meck, and this is his mother. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, Pastor Meck. Yeah. Yeah, Josh uh, was one of my, my, I gave him his first airplane ride. And right now, uh, he's a captain for Delta. So, so I, I am very proud of him. Uh, we've, we've also had other people, I don't know if you know George Nimmer or the Nimmers. Uh, George was another one. He went to uh, Southern Illinois University, uh, was top of his class, and he's, he's out flying. I don't know where he's at, but I know he's flying for, for some airline. Um, this day was the uh, uh, new hire, uh, kind of a new hire party. So the, uh, um, they had a little dinner for all the, the new people that they brought on. And he, this, this is a, a kind of a cute story, too. These two girls were terrified when, when I first, and that's what happens with a lot of the kids. They, they get uh, real nervous. And these, these two kids were picking on each other all the time as they were, they were getting into their plane. And once we got down, they were all smiles. So that was a, that was a fun uh, a group of kids. Uh, like I said, we have our T28. Uh, um, Clinic, so you got uh, between I don't know, probably 11 to 19, 20 air, aircraft coming out. Has anybody been to the, the T28 clinic? You have, okay. So we got those guys coming out. Are they, uh, based, are they based in Sheboygan? No, no. Actually, there's only one T28 that's based in in Sheboygan. One uh, T28 is based in Waukesha. His name is Paul Walter. He's on our board, and that's how they got there. What they did was they. Uh, a couple of them did the flyover for Road America uh, for the, the national anthem, and they had to land someplace, so they, they came to Sheboygan, and they said, uh, hey, this is a pretty nice place. They used to be uh, out of uh, Dubuque. They used to do their clinic down in Buke, and it wasn't air conditioned. I mean, this is, we had the Taj Mahal compared to that, just a hangar they were working out of. So um, that's, our, that's our T28 clinic. Um, you can see the people, and people come out and, and check out the airplanes, and um, they do a, a different flights and stuff like that, and they'll do passovers. Uh, they probably, I know they pass over the city here. We have our uh, Wings and Wheels. We have, uh, how many people have been to Wings and Wheels? Okay, good. So uh, we, we uh, do, do pancakes and stuff around, uh, oh, I don't know, around 900 900 pancake breakfast, uh, airplanes, cars, uh, boats, and other other things, um, activities, rockets for schools, stuff like that. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, uh, tractors. Tractors is another thing, just different things out there. And 
at the end of my presentation, I always got to thank the volunteers that, that come out to the Heritage Center and, and help us. Without the volunteers, we, we wouldn't be able to uh, um, survive. Uh, they're a great group of people. And uh, like I said, without them, we, we couldn't uh, survive. So they, they were open from uh, 11 to 4, Wednesday through Sunday. And they come out, open up the building, and, and uh, answer people's questions, take phone calls, stuff like that. So if you're sitting around and uh, have nothing to do, come on out and volunteer. So other than that, that's, that's the end of my uh, presentation. Yes. You forgot to mention the movies that are out there. Oh, yes, I did. Sorry, sorry, Dan. Good. Yes. Good. Thank you. Um, we do have some movie schedules, and we have some other stuff over on where uh, Travis is. If you want to pick that stuff up, it tells a little bit about the T33, the, the uh, movie nights uh, schedules, uh, and a little bit about the museum. I don't have a lot of brochures on the museum, but uh, uh, our DC3 also, it tells about the DC3. Second. So, Second to, uh, second Friday of every month, we present an aviation movie. <clears throat> I've been doing this for 15 years, and nobody ever gets tired of it. <laughs> Not even me. So it's all aviation-based theme movies and some documentaries on uh, all types of aviation systems and women pilots, the whole works. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It's, I, I run it like a history class. And uh, I, I encourage crowd involvement, uh, experiences, whatever, questions and answers. It's a lot of fun. Make it a destination. Oh. The, movie starts at, the movie starts at 7 o'clock, but we usually have, sometimes we have a guest speaker. Sometimes I talk about the movie and talk about the Aviation Center and stuff like that. There's one more thing I wanted to say. When Dave was showing that picture of the, the airport now, I was thinking, what would these guys think? <laughs> if you could go back with a time machine, grab all these people, and stick them on the ramp during the Ryder Cup, their jaws would hit the floor. They thought they'd be on another planet, but this was their vision. They, it's amazing, even talking to the chaplains, like uh, Ryle and Wanda, Joanne, uh, I'm good. they're amazed at as how far the, the I was, was going to say, uh, when I was talking to Ryle, Chaplin, and uh, Wanda, Joanne, they're, they're amazed as the uh, what the airport's looking like now compared to when they first started it. Uh, Lot, lot of progress. I know that the uh, taxiway, they're going to do a couple more improvements. Uh, the tax, some of the taxiways are going to be lengthened, stuff like that. So they're constantly uh, improving that taxi, or excuse me, the, the airport, because that's that's what brings in business. Uh, uh, Harry Chap Chaplin said it was uh, the the air gateway to Chemoin County. And he was right. And this this T twenty eight thing that Dave was talking about. You need to see this because up at Air Venture, you don't get that close to the pilots and you don't get that close to the airplanes at all times. You do, do get out by the airplanes, but the pilots, when they're at the center, they're there. They're not sequestered somewhere else. So they're very engaging. And this was a windfall for them because, like Dave said, they were... All these groups of aircraft, different types of military trainers are in groups and they're always training and trying to find a place where they can all get together and train before air venture is not easy. They were competing with AT6 groups, T34 groups, and they just, it was not, it was just getting to be ridiculous where they could, could not find a place that would really suit them. Um, some of the T28 pilots were coming up for wings and wheels and we, when we built the facility, Paul Walter said, wow, this is really cool. Would you mind? <laughs> and we said, yes, indeed. So that, that verse was history. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's at the end of July, about four days before they fly up to Air Venture, and that's just a phenomenal experience. If you like round engines, it's a place to go. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, 
Have there been any thoughts of the airport getting a control tower? As of right now, uh, I don't know if anybody knows. As of as of right now, uh, a lot of the corporates say, uh, with the general aviation, uh, we're we're getting along. Basically, what you do is you radio out, and it broadcasts over the whole area. And uh, we we don't have any problems with uh, the corporates, the jets and stuff. I mean, when I'm up flying, if I hear a jet coming in, I'll just peel off and go out until they land, and then I'll come come in. Uh, uh, we had a meeting with Chuck Mayer way back, and he also said that the uh, uh, Chuck Mayer was one of the airport managers, and he said that uh, uh, the, the corporates are fine without having a, a control tower. Uh, Although we did have a control tower for NASCAR, and we had a control tower for the PGA, the, the golf outing. Temporary so, towers Temporary came tower, out. yeah. It's temporary tower. But most of the general aviation airports in the area are radio controlled. Everybody has their own frequency. Every airport has their own frequency, and you just radio in your intentions, coming in, uh, downwind, whatever. Right. Uh, trying not sure. to crash. <laughs> you, know, you always tell your position, you know, like you're five miles out. Or, it's yeah, all about it's communication. Harder. Communications is huge. Something that I had to learn with my wife, but it's <laughs> nothing. <laughs> yeah. um, something else. Oh, Dave, I didn't mention this. Dave is a licensed pilot. He has his own yeah. airplane. I, I started learning in 1983 uh, with Chaplin. Harry Chaplin was still living. And uh, from there, I went on to get my instrument rating, uh, my multi-engine, and I also have a seaplane rating, which was really fun. Landed on Michigan, and usually did, we did most of our training on uh, Lake Winnebago. So that was a fun, fun uh, uh, license to get. I'm sorry. Uh, that, that, that was uh, huge. That was a good You point. had to bring that up. <laughs> no, that's good. I'm glad you did because I, I can show you. If I can find it. Oh, there it is. What was the if, question? Uh, uh, how, how am I making sure that that DC-3 doesn't move again? <laughs> if you look right here, they call them jer jersey barriers. They're uh, heavy cement. I mean, you got to take a forklift uh, to move to move those things. And I don't know if you can see it, but uh, there's a, a chain that we have it chained down, so so it doesn't move. We learned our lesson. <laughs> Isn't there a tailwheel lock on there too? Yes, uh, th and that's what happened when it went into the building. We didn't have the tailwheel locked, so every time uh, the plane sits. Uh, you're all supposed to always supposed to lock the tailwheel. Yeah, so. we hit, the plane was parked on the back side of the building where the ramp is. It was parked towards the windows of the building, and the wind rotated the aircraft 90 degrees into the yeah. building. Fortunately, it didn't touch any of the windows. I I was I was surprised that it didn't break windows. Yeah, that was amazing. But when they told me that, I couldn't believe it either. Is there any, anybody? Hey, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, what's the largest military or commercial plane that can land on this runway? I, uh, I was there one day, and there was a 707 that came in. Um, that, although that aircraft came in before the ramp was done, and they had uh, metal plates about that thick that they put underneath the wheel so it wouldn't sink into the blacktop. Not right now, uh, that, that concrete is like, 11 to 12 inches thick. So um, uh, we have uh, Global Expresses coming in. Those are pretty big planes. We had a C-130 once. C-130, yeah. Uh, Last year I saw an Albatross come in there. Yes. That was pretty good. Yeah, oh, yeah. That was very cool. Yeah. yeah, that was on its way up to Air Venture. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was a really it was, it was great. It. A beautiful big airplane. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah, gorgeous. He, well, actually, what he did, uh, there was a guy from Sheboygan. I don't know if he was a photographer or what, but he came to pick him up. And so he, he ran out there and jumped in the airplane, and they took off for uh, Air Venture. So, yeah, that was, that was a nice airplane. Yes? I watch How to Catch a Smuggler all the time. And how do you... <laughs> I know, but how you got customs there, and you call up somebody's 
say hello, can you come in? We have a plane landing, or do you have somebody there all the time? Or Actually, how do you check customs? Well, c customs is there. Uh, I forget their hours, but there's a guy there. But you do have to make a reservation to, to go come into customs. Um, and then at nighttime, cold, I see a lot of uh, color jets coming in. And all of a sudden, you'll see the customs guy come flying up. So, or I shouldn't say fly, but drive, drive up. <laughs> um, uh, the, the customs, as far as uh, Sheboygan County uh, jets, uh, Johnsonville, they have a big Global Express. Um, they can, they can uh, I've seen them coming in a bunch of times from probably, I don't know where they're coming in from. Um, but those jets can fly 7,000 uh, miles, you know, without refueling or anything. Um, so uh, they're, they're coming in from all over the world. So, so it's, it's not just uh, uh, these small little jets. I mean, they're, they're doing business all over the world. Yes, go ahead. That that wingtip, um, it's it's big. It's it's about this tall. Um, it's really light though. I can pick it up by myself, but uh, uh, I'd say it's probably six feet um, by four feet. So well, as big as this table. Oh uh, yeah, it's, something like the, that. The, the length probably is. It's it's a lot bigger. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. But uh, you know, aluminum isn't. It, it's strong when it's riveted together, but uh, it's very weak too. So, well, if they made it, if they made it to, to be sturdier, it wouldn't be able to get off the ground. Right, it'd be too heavy. It'd be pretty heavy. Anybody else? Uh, yes. Your question? The, the Kohler? The, the original Kohler? Um, that was right. Well, you can answer that. If you know where the, where the facility is now, um, the older buildings, it was uh, north by northeast of that area. There's a cemetery out there. It's, yeah, I think, it was, I think it was to the east of that or just in that area. I remember as I remember as a boy, there was still a hangar out there, an older yes. Quonset type hangar. Right, and uh, that's about where it was. As a kid, I worked for the Kohler uh, Stables and Farms, and we used to put uh, farm machinery, their farm machinery, in that that Quonset, that old hangar. So it's kind of kind of interesting. Anybody else? Awesome. Thank you very much, Dave. Dan, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I'd have to say that aviation in Sheboygan County is a, a special thing. Um, when I was in high school, I was able to take an aviation course in high school. Uh, and the final exam was flying a four-seater Cessna from Sheboygan to Oshkosh, Oshkosh to Manitowoc, and Manitowoc back to Sheboygan. And we got our final grade on the pre-flight checks, uh, mapping out the routes, doing all the radio calls. About the only thing we didn't get to do was work the rudders. The, the pilot worked the rudders, but we did everything else. So um, I think that lens, you know, once I went off to school and I told, you know, people I got to know from other areas that I flew airplanes for a high school class, they couldn't believe it, they thought I was lying. So I think this aviation has a real special history in our, in our community and I, uh, the way it looks and the way it sounds, it's only gonna continue to get bigger and better. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you all again for attending. Um, I'd like to thank HC Denison for their sponsorship of our programming here at the museum.